live, going live, going live, you're live. Good afternoon, everybody. Special hello to Miss Shonda. Thank you for stopping by. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you again, Shonda. I hope you're doing well. Hi, Robin Dog. You have been such a crank. Oh my goodness. You have been, Robin has been so crabby with everybody. The crabbiest. I have like the image of her um, like in a high school click. And she's that popular girl that is, that is still like a bee to everybody, but somehow she's still popular. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Yes, that's you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful and you're sweet at heart. But you're still mean sometimes. Um, she's been picking on poor Pom Pom. Um, but um, I titled the uh, live stream about uh, Fair Cavalier puppy prices. I'm gonna fill my water bottle real quick and then I wanted to um, talk about that. I'm not real, I'm sorry. That's Drew and I have been in contact with families um, about puppies and um, a lot of families have been really confused about pricing and some families have been kind of shocked to see, um, like either way, they've been shocked to see how high up cattle prices can be. And some families have been shocked to see um, our prices, thinking that they would be higher. Um, and so there's just such a disparity that we wanted to kind of go over um, because there's such a range. You can, if you just go on to Google, like at any given time right now, you can probably find a puppy for as least as $300 and as high as like 8,800. And so um, there's different tiers of like the quality that you're gonna get, of course. Um, but there are some, there between the ranges of like questionable quality and good quality, um, that's where it gets tricky because you don't wanna overspend, um, but you, you also want to, um, you wanna get what you're paying for too. So, um, Drew and I kind of want to talk about how you can determine if who you're talking to is what they say they are. Um, because there are some price points that we can tell you like straight off the bat, like you're probably rolling the dice on a puppy that is uh, like $300, you're really rolling the dice. Um, because there's, there's um, I'll just let me make my water bottle and then talk about it. I know, now you guys get your ice cubes. joining me on this talk, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to speak for uh, Because um, well, when we first, first started looking for a Cavalier, we had no idea what price was reasonable. Um, and it's so hard to tell online because everybody says they're a good breeder. <laughs> and so you have to learn how to read between the lines. Um, and so we kind of, I'm going to refer to the text I sent to the family. Um, but Drew and I, we've noticed like these different tiers and so generally speaking, um, 
if you if you find if a breeder who is doing health testing and regular regular evaluations, um, they're raising their puppies in a home like environment. They're socializing them. They're very involved in the raising of their puppies. Uh, their general goals align with bettering the future generations of Cavaliers. Now, um, those breeders charge in the area of between 2,000 and 4,500, largely depending on your location. So like the West Coast is more like 4,500. Um, here in the Midwest, like 2,500, which is what we charge, 2,500 is probably about the average. Um, and Coast is usually like 3,000 to 3,500. Yeah, East Coast is like kind of right between there. Um, now, the price you should never have to go above is 4,500. There are breeders that will charge 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 dollars um, that it's just unnecessary. You can find a puppy who is just as outgoing or just as friendly with the things that you're looking for. You can find that puppy somewhere else that has had um, health tested parents that is still um, it's still meeting all of yeah, the it's still an excellent dog at a price point that is several thousand dollars less. Yes. Um, and the thing is too about those price points is you'll find breeders of both qualities. You'll find the puppy mill dogs where they're just charging an exorbitant amount, and then you'll also find dogs that are good quality, but the breeders are just for whatever reason, they're charging a lot more. It might not even be that they're overcharging necessarily. It could just be that they have a really high demand. They they only have one litter a year and they've got 50 families waiting. It, it could be something like that. Um, and so that's what I mean by like, you can find a puppy just as good for less money. If, you know, if you're not particularly attached to that breeder and you're not really wanting to spend 6,500 on a puppy just to get it from that breeder, you can find a puppy just as good from another breeder. Um, the gray area, do you want to get comfortable? I'm good. I'm good. Really? Because you look like you're like about to get up and it's making me kind of, uh, like, it's making me feel rushed. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm sitting, it's really wet. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's kind of like. Uh, the really gray area is, um, is that below $2,000 price. Um, between like 15 and 1800, you can find, so like right now, um, we've recently in our state and in a lot of other states, they have banned, um, sales of puppies and kittens, I believe in pet stores. And, um, that's forcing backyard breeders, puppy mills, people who have contracts with these different facilities, it's forcing them to find a new way. And so one of the new ways that they're going is by creating breeder profiles on different websites. Um, and, uh, um, what was I gonna say? Um, breeder profiles on websites, they'll pose as, um, you know, like a family breeder. Um, there usually won't be a whole lot of information about them. Um, but usually, generally speaking, um, it's easy to, all you have to do is spot those breeders. Um, all you have to do is ask them some questions. Ask them how they chose their moms, how they chose their dads. They should be able to explain that to you because if they are responsible breeders who are doing what they say they do, you know, picking good parents, they will have an answer for that. They'll be able to explain, well, this is how we chose our mom. This is, you know, just like we can explain how we chose Daisy. Um, it shouldn't be something that's difficult for them to answer. Um, and so there's little questions you can ask, just kind of quiz them. Um, but to kind of rule out that your breeder could be a puppy mill breeder is to ask questions about those individual dogs. See how well they know their dogs. Um, um, find out, um, and this is kind of where papers are kind of questionable and we discourage families from relying on papers. Um, to be to prove anything because papers every pet store puppy in the 1990s and the early 2000s were sold with AKC papers and so papers don't carry a whole lot of weight they're a data point in a bigger picture 
Um, and so I wouldn't go off papers alone. Um, but um, another thing is that um, puppies that are, so those puppies between price like $1,500, you can usually either find a good breeder who does health testing, who um, who has quality moms and dads. Um, they just like to have two litters a year, and it's just kind of a side thing um, that they do. Oftentimes, you can find those breeders at that price point. Um, they don't have litters very often. Um, it's not like their big money making thing. It's just it's just a hobby, and so. Um, they enjoy raising dogs on the side, and, um, and so you can have the good end of that, and then you can have the bad, the, the puppy mill end, the backyard breeder end, where they're trying to hike up their prices a little bit to get something without being so much to start causing more questions to be asked. You know, if they charge $3,000, they are going to have more questions being asked of them. Yeah, especially, you know, once you start getting into the, the $2,500 to $3,000 range for a dog, you should be able to say, hey, I'd like to come see, uh, you know, my puppy once they're four weeks old or something like that. And if they are very hesitant or standoffish or they don't want, or they're not, they're not okay with you coming to, to visit, that's, you know, those, that should be kind of like triggering some, uh, some alarm bells uh, in your head. Uh, but there's all these, like Elizabeth said, there's, there's all these little things that you can ask to kind of, uh, you know, kind of, like she said, read between the lines, you know, um, read the, the gray matter in between the, the black and white. Um, you can ask them, right? They have got this, like, dominance Jeez, assertion stop. thing going on and on. Stop with everybody. Yes, you, you two are just, <laughs> but things is like, not trying to get away. Daisy's not trying to get I away. Know. Just like, like, she, she's, she wants puppy so badly that Daisy has been um, presenting to all the females. Yeah. She's backing like up somebody, her. Somebody. Yeah, somebody mate with me. Um, but so there's that those price range of those puppies that are like 1500 to $1,800 that um, you can find a good puppy in that price range. Just be sure to verify, ask those important questions, fill them out. Um, and then there's puppies that are less than that, that are like 1,400 and below 800. Um, those puppies, at least in our experience, seem to be, um, you know, there's an issue with them. Um, like they've got some sort of defect that isn't life-threatening, but is just kind of problematic, um, like, like a cosmetic defect. Um, um, and then also um, backyard readers or and I don't mean backyard breeders in like a negative way. I just mean somebody whose dog got out and got pregnant. Um, they're usually just trying to get compensation for their time and vet bills. And um, they don't really know the going rate for um, Cavaliers. Plus, they're also aware of the fact that they didn't, you know, have all the testing. They, you know, they didn't, um, they aren't breeders by trade. And so... They're not trying, usually they're not trying to turn it into a big money-making venture if it happens kind of by accident. Um, and so you can still find, so like if a family has a couple of Cavaliers that they don't have fixed, a girl and a boy, and as, as long as they're not related, um, you can have accidents happen like that where the two dogs might very well be very good dogs and the puppy is a good quality puppy. It's just that they aren't the family themselves. They aren't. Um, they're established as breeders doing it intentionally. Um, and so like in those kind of special circumstances, you can find um, a good quality Dad? puppy for a decent price. Um, when you are looking at the, when you're looking at if a breeder gives you those numbers of like 1500, 2000 really, um, just to verify, I would say like probably one out of three, you can get a, you can find a good one. Maybe one out of four. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's a little a little more cynical on that one. I'm yeah. Um, but um, um, oh um. But I mean, again, these are all things like, like when you are looking at a puppy. Um, you should really, 
you know, be asking uh, questions uh, of the breeder. Um, uh, if you're getting a, a weird vibe or if, it, if there's some sort of, I mean, um, you know, I, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the person, I sell the puppies for this other person. Oh, yeah, um, you heard that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of those going around and that's usually like, um, you know, a certain uh, uh, religious sect that doesn't use electricity, they can't use the internet. And so, we really don't want this to come off the wrong way. Yeah. And so, um, because we don't, it has nothing to do with the affiliation with religion. It's just um, this particular um, demographic, <laughs> this particular demographic. Um, they just, they, they raise puppies as a living. They always have, and that's just the way it's always been for them. Mm -hmm. But times have changed and advanced with, you know, health, health testing, the way that breeders do things. And um, this group has, they haven't kind of kept up with those changing times. And so they're often in that 15 to $1,800 range, um, but they don't usually do health testing. Um, anything that's like any sort of advanced would require any sort of advanced um, technology, yeah. any technology really. Yeah. Um, you know, they probably don't do. Um, their puppies are usually, I think they're usually socialized. Um, things that aren't tech related, um, they still do well with. They're vaccinated. Um, um, usually, you know, always check. But um, they're oftentimes, they will oftentimes have you meet another person um, because they have somebody else handle, they don't have internet, so they have somebody else handle their ads, their um, communications. And so it can also be kind of tricky to talk to them because they don't. The, it, <laughs> the, the person that has the listing online probably doesn't have the puppy in their possession. Uh, it's probably someone else. And so if you're asking, you're like, hey, I'd like to come and see the puppy. And the person's like, oh, well, I, I'm, I don't have the puppy. I'm just putting this ad up for a friend. You should be like, okay, well, that's uh, you know, odd. It doesn't mean that the breeder is bad. It yeah. just means to ask questions. Yeah, just ask that's all that means, yeah. to ask questions. Um, but that's a trend that we've noticed um, because Drew and I have come upon these ads ourselves in looking for our dogs. And so um, that's how we've kind of learned kind of what their methods are um, and how to spot them. Um, and they usually, they will usually be those ones um, that have like a go between can be a little more aggressive. It feels like, um, like if you don't respond to them, they'll be like, are you still interested? Are you still interested? Um, but the thing is, is breeders who take the appropriate measures to breed quality puppies, they are very concerned about where their puppies go. And, um, I can assure you that we would not feel comfortable putting, um, the vetting of our families in the hands of somebody else. Um, we even we don't even make ads for our puppies because it's it's like um, you know newspapers are such a thing of the past that um, you know like the ads in there that you find in there are like kind of sketchy sometimes um, and so oh my gosh I thought that was Bella yelling and like she was out there by herself <laughs> um, uh, but with the inability for some of these like puppy wholesalers to continue to just sell their puppies in mass to pet stores. Um, they've had to adapt. And so how they're adapting is by going one way that they're adapting is by going to places like puppyspot.com and creating multiple um, reader profiles and the list all their you know puppies there. Um, and how you can spot those is the location. If you see all these different reader profiles, and they're all in McLean, Illinois, and McLean is, you know, this big, um, you know, that's the same person. Um, but you kind of want to avoid having to go through all that in the first place. Um, during COVID and really for those couple of years that followed, 
breeders, it seems, a lot of breeders got used to meeting families at a neutral location, which is fine in, in you know, some situations, but I feel like um, as breeders ourselves, um, when we are making it our mission and our living to create better cavaliers and future generations, um, we are, we know that your puppy growing up in our home, you have a right to, you, we, we're kind of extending that. It's a bit of an obligation on our part to invite you into our home so that you can see where your puppy is growing up. And really since COVID, we have noticed that a lot of breeders aren't really going back to that. A lot of them are kind of keeping this distance. And I mean, it is a lot of work speaking from, you know, the breeder's perspective, it is a lot of work to get ready for families to come over. So I can't say that, like I can, we can understand how it gets real easy to be com comfortable yeah, made, not having families over. Yeah, how it made it a lot easier to say, oh, you want to meet your puppy or you want to see your puppy? Okay, I'll bring, I'll meet you at this park. Meet you at McDonald's. Yeah, I'll meet you at McDonald's or whatever. Miles. And then you don't have to worry about making sure that the living room is and, yeah, and everything is all picked up and looking looking nice and clean. Because, I mean, we, we hear a family of, of five and so the house can get a little bit Messy. With a lot of puppies, too. Yeah, 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 with puppies and stuff. So it's, um, we can see how when COVID came around and they're like, oh, well, you're, you know, they kind of had uh, the... Everybody the, had to social distance. Yeah, all the social distancing, the distancing guidelines and all that sort of stuff. They had that to kind of fall back on and said, oh, well, let's meet in, you know, in a park. Uh, they kind of held on to that and said, oh, well, this is nice. This like, is working nicely. Yeah, way. this works out well. I don't have to worry about that stuff. So... But um, for us personally, uh, we think that, that is you know, part of of the job is for. I mean, it, it goes with the uh, the live stream where we want you guys to be able to see uh, how and where your puppies are being raised and um, what it's like. Uh, you know, so that you're you understand that you so that you know that you're getting what you're paying for. Um, and even for like, I feel like especially for breeders who are not using something like a live stream, um, it's even more important, I think, for them to have that transparency with you, to have you over and kind of see where their puppies are being raised. It's, you don't have one idea of an idea of what it even looks like, and so um, asking to come over. Um, and I, I received a message from a family who they said, "Please, I don't want to impose." And um, by as asking to come over, and um, that's the thing is, that's part of what we do. We want families to come over. We want you to come and see, um, meet the moms, meet um, meet the dads, see where they grow up, meet us. Yeah, meet the packs, see what it's <laughs> like here. Um, and so that's not imposing. If any breeders have made you feel like it's imposing, um, you're not, because as a breeder, that's just part of the job. If if you are a good breeder who cares about where your puppies are going, we're just as interested in you guys coming over as you guys are in coming over because it gives us an opportunity to meet you and see, you know, the family that might be taking a puppy home. So um, you should not feel like you're imposing by asking to come over to see our dogs or any other breeder. Um, if anything, a breeder should expect it. If you're asking that, um, it should not be anything unusual for them to hear. Oh, hey, they, 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 now, Vienna. Here. She loves me. I know she loves um, you. Let me get my message I sent just see, uh, see if I missed anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, anyone who breeds more than two breeds. Oh, yeah. So if a breeder, um, so we see it as like a specialty. Um, cavaliers, each breed has something very different about them. And cavaliers are extremely different from German shepherds, and border collies, and pit bulls. They're all so different. And there are different things to take into consideration that come with different breeds. Pugs have issues with their flat faces, their noses that are smooshed up against their faces. Uh, <laughs> 
And there's all these different little things that you need to take into consideration. And so as we learned about Cavaliers and things that affect them, yeah, it's important so that you can make good decisions about your future generation, future um, years of puppies. She wants something to do. Um, so that you can, if there's any problems that you see or you recognize early on, you can pull them from the pool to encourage no. them to be healthy, forward um, progression of the breed. If we are splitting our attention to that detail between two different breeds, it is a disservice to the dogs. It's kind of, it starts to misalign with what we're trying to do because that other breed, we really need to understand that breed just as well as we understand Cavaliers. And so that's why we say more than two breeds because if a breeder has those like Cavaliers and another type of Spaniel, you can kind of see where how that one led into the other. And so we tell families that if a breeder is breeding two breeds, just find out the story there. Um, you know, maybe they did they did one breed their whole lives. They grew up with another breed, and then they were breeding a different breed as an adult. And then they decided to pull in the other breed that they felt. Um, and so there can be a perfectly logical explanation that that doesn't mean that they don't know the breeds. Um, that's how we say to just ask questions. Um, but the breeders who have um, like four or five breeds. It's oftentimes a red flag for a puppy mill situation um, because to have four or five breeds, that means you have at least four or five moms yeah. at a minimum. That's just one mom. And so they're probably wanting litters all year round. So that's probably more like two or three moms per breed. And so you can see how that starts adding up fast. And not, not only that, but if you want a purebred dog, yeah. if you have males, you got to make sure that your males aren't mixing uh breeds so and that's a really it's another really good point um i can't imagine having two males of two different breeds that we're having to play um it's <laughs> the game um tetris with trying to fit them around the girls that are in need and not in need great breed um and so but like think about it if you have a how much longer are you doing that it's really loud i'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, but if you have, if somebody has six different breeds, or even four different breeds, they have four different breeds. When they have a mom of one breed going to heat, Hi, Dad. Um, it's difficult just for us to make sure the boys stay away from the girls that are on break. Um, and so they have to have a way to make sure that those breeds are not mixing up. And so what that means is that their dogs are not able to mingle. Chances are they're, they're not like this, where they're all able to mingle and play and um, hang out together. They're, that when they have more breeds, that usually means more fencing, more crates, more organization um, in order to keep them from um, mixing, because that would be a really big problem for them if a male of one breed bred with a female of another breed. And so facilities like this, they don't see breeding as like bettering the breed. They see breeding purely as a like manufacturing sort of thing. They are producing a product that there is a demand for. And so they are just looking at it as a numbers sort of game. And so that's why they're offering more breeds. They're offering five or six breeds. And then they've got three or four moms, probably more. I'm trying to be generous. Um, but they will have them. Created. They'll have them in different rooms. They'll have them all separated, but they will have them controlled in a separated way because they're not controlled. And that's where you start risking males mating with other females. And they're going to have a heck of a time selling those puppies that are mixed breed. Um, and so when there's a facility that says that they breed um, <laughs> either three or more, yeah. yeah, three or more, or if they're breeding like a couple of really very different breeds. You know, if it's like golden retrievers and cavaliers, that would be okay because of the whole, um, or maybe not golden retrievers, but like cavapoos, the poodles and the cavaliers, if they need to understand both of both breeds and then they're breeding both together, that makes more sense. What doesn't make sense is having a husky and a cavalier and um, golden retriever. Yes, and then a golden retriever and the lab and just like things of all these different varieties that you don't usually mix together. 
Um, just and again, again, this is just what we're saying is uh, we want you to ask questions. Yes, yeah, so it just means ask questions. Yes. It doesn't mean they're bad. It means um, just to ask questions so that you can determine if they are, um, if they are. Uh, what the heck? Um, so this this company is using our footage. Isn't that just an ad? Yeah, it's an ad, but that's not. This oh wait, is what, yeah, that's not from. This is today's, or this is. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> oh, that's YouTube advertising. You know, yeah. we have views from YouTube advertising. Yeah. That's that's. that's that's so funny. Lemonade Pet is using <laughs> Lemonade is, yeah, Lemonade. Holy crap, Lemonade Pet. What, let me see. Lemonade Pet is the, is the insurance. Yeah, I know. should be paying us. It's interesting, it's gotta be an AI thing, because that's stuff that just happened. I mean, my outfit. It's so um. Did I, oh wait. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that was my mistake. I was saying, I thought there is an, oh, dang. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> Somehow I accidentally. just an ad. It, I thought it was an ad, but. Um, uh, oh, so those facilities that have multiple breeds, um, that's kind of from the days of like the 90s and the 2000s when they were able to sell puppies in mass more. And now that, that we're coming away from that as a society, um they're struggling to continue business as they were and so that's kind of why you, you want to ask all these questions to try to filter through anyone who is posing um as a regular breeder um uh, well but ultimately you know we we kind of talked about there's usually like three tiers of 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 pricing um but in every tier there can be good actors and there can be bad actors and so what we really want to you know leave with you guys is ask questions ask questions ask questions that's the that's the big thing is that you know when you are ready for a puppy when you're ready to adopt a, a new pet it can be very, you know, like it's very easy to get blinded by, you know, the the sweet and soft, puppy yeah, yeah, cute little, yeah, cute puppies. especially Cavaliers, they all look like stuffed animals. Yeah, so cute. exactly. You, it's it's easy to kind of like put on the blinders when you're seeing that stuff and get tunnel vision on how cute this puppy is, and and not look, you know, further into the surrounding stuff like. You know what the what the breeder is potentially doing and, and so that much. Um, and so we're just wanting to impart with you guys to to ask questions to 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 not get the blinders on as you smell say yeah, yeah to not get tunnel visioned um, and uh, you know keep thinking about about okay this breeder has this really cute puppy is there anything potentially amiss so sorry um so another sneaky little thing that happens is there are various um what do i call them databases yeah. they're like these mini databases and they call readers from around the country to essentially like work with them and they have different models some of them will do all the advertising all the like work they'll do the vetting of the family um and then They'll be the middleman, and they'll Charges match them. puppy to the family. They'll, they'll get you know a cut of the price of the puppy, and then for on the breeder's side, you know they take care of the sale. And you want to be careful with those because um, you know when Drew when Drew and I are kind of evaluating those sorts of things, we look at it from the perspective of a breeder who is investing their their time and their money into making a better quality dog and there is there isn't a world where we would put um in some company's hands 
are the puppies that we create and we raise and we, we get to know and we bond and we care very much about where those puppies go and where they are and who they're with. And I don't know the various breeder contacts of ours. I don't know of any that would be comfortable um, listing their puppies on a website like that, on like a third party who is handling the, the transaction. Um, because breeders want to get to know their families. A good breeder wants to get to know their families. Um, and that's partly why, um, you know, pet store puppies back in the early 2000s and the 1990s, you know, I remember walking around them just wondering, like, where did they, where did they come from? Um, because they would have, like, one of all these different breeds. They'd have, like, six puppies and a little glass thing. Um, and they'd all be different breeds. There wouldn't, it wouldn't be litter mates. They'd all be different breeds. And it was always so curious to me where they came from. But those breeders that they did come from, they still exist. They just have to find a different way to make the sale. Because like I said earlier, to them, it's just merchandise. It's not a dog. It's not a family member. It's not a pet. It's not a, it's a human. It's not a being. It's not, um, not a living creature to them it is just merchandise and sales and business and so it's a, it's a, yeah, like what you said it's a product yeah it's, a, it's product. a product that there's a demand for um but they don't see it as anything more than that and so you know when you call and say my puppy's sick they don't really care um and so that's why asking questions will really really help you determine because you know if you were to ask us how you find your moms we can we can explain that to you but somebody who was supplying their dogs, you know, in mass, like I described, they might not even know which mom you're talking about. Like their, their response will clue you in to the fact that they don't really know their dogs that well. Bella is really bugging me because I told yeah, her that. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we talked about the majority of everything, so. Okay. Love you. Love you. Yeah. Bye. Um, oh, let me grab one thing, Bella. No. But um, one of the websites that we know to be good is gooddog.com. Um, the only issue I have with them, we have them with them. Um, we don't really we don't really do a lot with them anymore. They used to be really, really good with connecting families to breeders, being very transparent, and, and they might still well be very good at that. We kind of stepped away from them after they began. Um, so when you would do a search for a hubby. Um, and you would find a breeder you wanted to contact. Um, they required families, so they started requiring families to enter their debit card information just to start a conversation with us. And we didn't realize that this was happening until families got a hold of us, like through our website, kind of around them, um, and told us that they were they're trying to get a hold of us through Good Dog, but that it was asking for their credit card information. And we didn't, we did hated that for that to be family's first impression of us. And they were trying to reach us on good dog and the response that looked like it was coming from us. Cause it was in like a text message format. And it says Redburn Cavaliers wants your, your card information for the $500 deposit. And so we even had one family that was really confused cause they, they did put their information in and they don't actually charge the deposit right then. They just want the information at that point. Um, and so the family was then saying to us, well, I put my deposit down, but she, she hadn't. She'd given good dog their her information. And so it was a lot of confusion. Um, but um, and so we got away, we got kind of away from good dog because the reason they were doing that is that they noticed that they were connecting families to breeders and then families and breeders would kind of step around them and they they wanted to get their cut of the pie. So. Um, they started to, they were trying to, they're trying to find a, a solution to require that if a family finds a breeder through them, that they essentially have to give good dog a cut of um, the deposit or the full price or, you know, whatever. And so um, we always tell families if they find us on good dog to not to just find our website and contact us through there because we won't charge you just to talk to us. But um that kind of flies in the face of everything we are aligning our whole business model around. And so it was, we really did not like that. Um, so we are on good dog, but we won't, we won't respond just because we are really 
you don't really check messages on there. Um, after they did that to a few families, we just we stopped using them. But they are good. Um, they are still a good database of breeders who, um, because breeders who are looking for good families, breeders that are okay with questions being asked of them are more more likely to sign up with a website like that. Um, still ask your questions because the, on the other side of that, you might have um, those puppy mill breeders, those mass producers of puppies that um, are trying to blend in and are trying to create profiles uh, as regular breeders. So you still want to ask your questions. Um, when families have been doing, um, not puppy families, but when breeder families, like backyard breeder families, if they've been doing this, they've been breeding dogs as just as merely as a way of making money for 30 years and suddenly all these laws are put in place that makes it more difficult for them to sell their puppies. They're not going to just stop what they're doing and start working at Starbucks. Um, they're going to just kind of find ways to work around the laws, um, especially if they've been doing it for that long and um, you know, it's difficult to, to adjust to a certain point, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of states are enacting a lot of really good laws, um, to stomp out pet store sales. Um, but the biggest thing that you can always kind of ask yourself when you're evaluating a breeder is would a good breeder, is this how a good breeder would, how would a good breeder answer this? How would a good breeder, how would they um, react to this question? Um, Cause the thing is most breeders, they do want to answer your questions. They do want to make, they do want you to be comfortable. Um, breeders are proud of their dogs. We're, we are so, we love our dogs. We are so proud of them. Um, we're proud of their puppies. Um, we like to brag about them. And so if your breeder is, doesn't want to talk about their dogs, if um, that's because they don't really know them, um, then that's a sign that they don't spend a lot of time with them. And so that's why just asking questions just really gives you a feel for the kind of breeder that they are. Um, Abbott is in heat, very in heat. We're gonna, our puppies this summer are gonna be like right after another. But I think it'll be broken up a little bit better than this last fall. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to talk about. Um, this this thing with like this database service, that's a newer thing I've noticed. Um, when we had our very first litter, that was when I first saw it and there was only like one or two that I could find. Um, but it seems to be whether it's, there's this, uh, there's all kinds of variations of the model of this and how involved the middleman website is, but it usually involves, um, they usually have essentially a database of breeders of different types of breeds and they're just from all over the country and it's like a, it's like a match.com for families and puppies, but you know, like on Good Dog, you're they're putting directly the family in contact with the breeder. On these little intermediary websites where they just have a database of breeders, those breeders are kind of behind the website. You're only communicating with the website and they might get you in touch with the breeders, but the transaction is still going through the website. And so that's how um, a lot of puppy mill puppies are able to get through there because there's a little, there's another layer of secrecy added. It's another layer of, a um, little layer for the family to have to get through. Um, but again, just ask yourself, um, you know, a good breeder, they care about where their puppy goes. How involved are the breeders? in this database, you know, on Good Dog, their, their database is of vetted breeders. Um, when we applied for our listing on Good Dog, we 
we had to do a, we had to fill out um, a questionnaire type thing. It was really more of a quiz and we did, it was sneaky because we didn't realize it. We thought it was a questionnaire and after filling it out and submitting it, they scored it and we realized that it was really more of a test and it was, it was really, it was clever because we thought it was a questionnaire, you know, like it was questions like, um, how many puppies a year do you have? Um, how many litters a year do you have? How many, um, litters in a lifetime does your mom, do your moms have? And so we just answer all these questions and then they gave us a score at the end. And I didn't realize that there were, you know, there were right or wrong answers to those questions and they scored your questions and, um, you had to have a certain score in order to be approved on the website. And then we also had a phone interview too. They, somebody called us and we did a phone interview. And so there is actually a bit of, um, you have to pass a test essentially to be for a good dog to okay you. Now, of course, that's not foolproof, um, but it's something. It's better than, um, than some of these databases of just say, hey, we'll hook you up. We'll find the puppy of your dreams. Um, because honestly, the more separation there is between the family and the breeder, the shadier it is. Like Drew was talking about um, breeders who have somebody that does all the communication for them. Um, the more layers there are between the family and the breeder, usually the more questions you should be asking. Because breeders want to be as direct to the families as we can be. And so there's just there's no upside to having somebody else do that middle work for us. The only upside would be that we had less tasks to do, but the whole job is getting to know families. And so it doesn't even really, it doesn't even work with what we're trying to do in the first place because our big thing is getting families and puppies to know each other. And through those sorts of services, you're not going to be able to get to know your puppy. Um, now for some families, it's not very important and that's okay too. Um, the way we do things is not necessarily the only way to do things. Um, we just want you guys to know when to ask questions. Dog. Yes, we need to trim your nails. Um, Cavaliers, too, another reason I think for their increased price, at least in the States here. Um, Cavaliers were only established as a breed in the U.S. Um, by AK, they were only recognized as a breed by AKC. In 1996, I think, 1997, 96 or 97. And so Cavaliers were not very common. And um, I mean, we didn't even really know they existed until, <clears throat> until right before we got them. Um, and so a lot of families, too, that stumbled upon our website haven't really had heard of Cavaliers either. They kind of found them through, um, you know, looking for a good family dog. Let's see, dog. guys all piled up. Myra's little puppy tummy is getting really firm. And so when she's sitting up and you go to feel her tummy, you can feel like her uterus where it, you know, it's not squishy anymore. You can feel where it, where it is. It's getting, getting bigger. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I hope that that was, I hope that's helpful for families. Here is just that it's just the cats here come on out come on come on come on come on come on here you want to go play with the kitties all right now come on Paris Paris come on come on Paris good girl come on good girl good girl thanks guys
Um, so when we got Robin, and so I don't know if prices have, um, prices have got to be going up a little bit just with the economy and everything else going up in price. Um, but Robin, when we got Robin, she was $3,000 back in 20, what are you Robin? Um, 2020? 2020? Um, 2021? Um, and so she was $3,000. Um, Paris and Pom Pom were 2500 each. They are 2500 um, Remy was 2500 Daisy was $3,500. Um, Missy was 2000 Myra was three thousand. Um, Spike and Macchiato. Um, Spike was fifteen hundred, and Macchiato was fifteen hundred. Um, Paris, you can't get snuggles. So I hope that gives like I hope that gives a little bit of a range um, for you guys on um, like. And that's what we pay for our Cavaliers. Um, we got some good ones, I think. I think we got some good ones. Yes. You're a good girl. You're a good girl. Um, the uh, girls almost across the board are always more expensive than the boys. Um, and that's why Macchiato and Spike, we got four less because every single grader that we purchased from charged a $500 premium on females. And that's something that Drew and I swore we would never do. Um, because it's just, it seem it just seems so predatory to us. Um, I know that for families, their gender preference for one girls are more popular. And I think that's why, um, readers do it because it's kind of a fast cash opportunity. Um, girls are in demand. A lot of families are willing to pay that extra fee just so they can have a girl. Um, because you don't ever have the potential issue of marketing with girls. And so I think for that reason, that's why girls tend to be more popular. Um, but for just as many um, like die hard female puppy lovers, there are just, there are maybe not just as many, but there are still a lot of very devoted boy puppy lovers. Um, and so we've just felt it unfair um, to charge extra for a female. Um, I mean, we, we paid it so that we could just get our dogs from good breeders and um, there wasn't a breeder that didn't, that we could find that didn't charge more for a female. And so we just paid it. Um, we, we wouldn't have paid it if we didn't have to, but, um, it's something now that we have that choice of as breeders ourselves, that you won't see us charge more for, <clears throat> charge that $500 premium for a female. Um, it's kind of silly to us because. You can't, I, the only explanation really is, is the, um, is that they're more in demand. There's no real logical reason to charge more for them, um, other than they can, um, you know, it's not like it costs more to the breeder, you know, there's no, there's no real reason other than well, more people want girls. Um, and just because more people want girls doesn't mean that you necessarily charge girls because for boys and girls, when it comes to Cavaliers, at least for us, you still run out. And so it's not like the price hike is keeping some on the shelves for families. That's not happening. Um, and they're not doing it for that reason either. And so um, uh, you won't see us charge that extra price. Another thing, I've only seen one breeder do this, but um, we did skip over this breeder for this reason. And... It's right by my ears. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was right by my ear. Oh, jeez. All right. That's all right. Um, 
But there was this breeder that we found on Good Dog, actually. That was pretty close by, like 45 minutes away. Um, and they had this beautiful litter of tricolor and blenheim puppies. Uh, oh, they were so beautiful. And we everything was perfect. The breeder was great. Um, what we could not get past, and you'll remember this as soon as I start mentioning it, what we could not get past, as beautiful and perfect as the puppies were, what we could not get past was their charging structure. Because for the cute puppies that we really liked that were the front runners, they were randomly priced at $38.95 and $41.95 and $42.95, just based on their subjective level of cuteness. Yes, just yeah, oh my gosh. And so, and then the boys, of course, were like twenty nine ninety five. You know, the girls were an extra thousand. Um, and we were looking for a couple of girls, and so of course we we could not justify this this um, same price. Well, this like total um, what's the word? Um, it was a subjective price that um, they chose for what they thought was cute. Yeah. Arbitrary. It's a totally arbitrary. It's a total arbitrary um, price, just based on no reason. But as Drew said, their subjective idea of what's cute. Um, and so, and because even think when we were looking, we were looking for two girls at the time, and that was actually when we ended up getting Paris and Pum Pum. Um, but there were these two girls we were looking at, and they were $38.95 and $41.95, respectively. And um, we we're kind of like, why 300 more on this other one? Why 300 more on this other one? There was no reason other than she was cute. And um, and it was especially obvious when the boys were priced way lower. But yeah, I remember when we first started seeing that, we thought they were, there was different breeders. Like, yeah. All these different prices. And then we found out. Like, they're just person. all within the same breed or within the same litter. Um, and so that sort of pricing is all just really predatory. And um, that's why we just charge one price. Um, even we had it, um, we had Missy's, Missy was our first. And so we had hers priced $500 less for a period of time. Um, until we really, until we realized that we raise all of our puppies the very same, and um, we should just have them priced the very same. Uh, but the reason was because um, her rear was unable to. She, um, Missy is AKC, um, but her breeder was unable to paper her because her mom, when Missy was born, was for AKC. They have to be at least two years old when the puppy is born paper them and um, Missy's mom was not yet two she was like a year and 11 months or something and so um, her mom was or the breeder was not able to paper Missy's letter specifically um, and it was her first letter it was just Missy and a sister and so because Missy wasn't able to be papered we um, gave a discount to families um, but over time we've kind of learned that um, the papers really we have all of our puppies are paper, other than um, Missy's, which we can't paper. Um, but all of our puppies are papered, and um, that's another thing that we like to talk to families about is that um, the puppy mill puppies usually come with papers um, because back, you know, during pet store days when puppy mills were like really on the rise, um, that was like their one way to kind of because you can hide behind a computer or an envelope, a letter and a, a form to fill out um, and say, you know, mom, this mom, this dad, this many puppies and get everybody papered and you don't have to verify anything. And so it was real easy for them to paper their puppies and be like, oh, see here, purebred and these are papered and here's your pedigree. Um, but you know, it doesn't really mean a whole lot if the parents have poor health and the pedigree of, um, ancestors are also not in great health um but they would just paper them just for the sake of it so they could say like see they're papered they're registered um but the active registration doesn't mean that they're quality puppies it just means that they got registered um and so that's kind of i feel like papers over the last 20 years or so they're um they're the 
the significance of their value when it comes to the quality of their breeding doesn't mean as much. Um, also because um, it's hard to keep track of papers and puppies and moms and dads. And it would be really easy with any more studs. It would be really easy to get litters mixed up, especially when we have multiple litters at once that we're papering or um, we've got, you know, um, litters coming, you know, two weeks apart and we're sending the registration papers off and, you know, we've got Pom and Macchiato here, Missy and Macchiato here, Remy and Macchiato here. And it could be easy to mix up like this litter has eight, this one has six, this one has four. Um, and I can only imagine that for somebody who is dealing with litters that, you know, they're having, they're having litters born every two weeks all around the year. Um, it's got to be like, you can't tell me that errors are not happening in there. And so, um, it's just, it's, it takes a lot more, um, organization than I think a lot of people realize. And so, um, I just, and after we have papered all the litters that we've papered and, um, gone through all of the registration process and all of that, um, I think about those facilities that have 200 moms and I don't know how they keep that straight and whether the papers are even correct on those puppies because, um, when, you know, when they're selling them en masse like that, um, you know, again, that's like where they see them as numbers, you know, cause I can see them starting to organize it as like litter one, you know, mom A, mom B, mom C, litter A, litter B, litter C. Um, and that's another thing too. I didn't think much of this back when we first started breeding and looking for puppies. But now that we have gotten a lot more involved in it, um, had a lot more exposure. And again, this is just a data point and it's just something to look out for and ask questions. Um, because we used to call our puppies by like their collar colors a lot. But if you have a breeder that strictly refers to their puppies as puppy A, puppy B, puppy C, if they are not interacting with their puppies in a way that they have got formed some sort of attachment to give them a nickname, um, ask questions. Um, you know, we would, we would color the puppies and, um, you know, blue would really fit their personality and it would just become blue, like, you know, blue, the dog on Nickelodeon. Um, I know freckles was blue and we called him blue for a while mm -hmm. and we'll come up with like, little nicknames. And so like in hindsight, when we look back and picking, looking at the puppies, you know, it makes sense if, they have a picture of a litter and they're just trying to identify which who's who. Um, but if in the listing you just see puppy one, puppy two, just um, just kind of store that one because it's just a little detail that might indicate that um, it's just very distant language and it's not personable. It doesn't have any like affection or warm emotion associated with the puppy. And so I would just be a little be a little curious about it um because when we talked about our puppies i mean we have their nicknames everywhere um and that's why i said you know context matters too if it's a picture and they're trying to identify them and they don't have the room to write out their names um you know that's worth considering too um but if it's, they're just listed as puppy a or puppy blue um just be leery because I think that's one of like the most exciting things in the beginning is being able to pick their names. Um, you know, whatever system that a breeder has down for that, whether you put colors on first and call them by the color names. Um, when you're interacting with them each day, it's almost impossible to not come up with some sort of nickname. And so if the breeder you're talking to um, has that warmth with the puppies, they'll, they will usually have nicknames for the puppies and you'll be able to hear it in their voice when they're talking about when they're talking about the puppy that you're, you're referring to. And so just another thing to pay attention to. I'm sorry, Paris, I've just got this weird mat right here. These mats in your ears.
But if, for anybody who is just joining us, who missed the beginning, um, just to recap, um, to find a to find a healthy cavalier a cavalier puppy specific to cavaliers, this is not um, does not include other breeds because price varies by breed um, a lot. <laughs> uh, so for cavalier puppies, for a healthy puppy that is coming from somebody who um, is um, has cleared their puppies or cleared their moms and dads for breeding in some sort of way, usually through health testing and evaluations with specialists. Um, the average price range is between 2000 and 4,500, like the mid 4,000s, um, maybe 4,800, but you should never pay more than that. So you should not have to pay more than 4,500, um, to find a healthy cavalier that is well socialized, whose breeder cares about them, um, whose breeder cares about all their puppies. Um, and so outside of those parameters, um, over 4,500 usually, that's a little more price gouging. You can still find healthy puppies, but they could be from breeders who, um, you know, maybe they only breed twice a year. And so they charge a little bit more because they have a lot of people who want puppies from them. Um, that's common um, for those price ranges. Um, but then you can also have puppy mills who are just literally price gouging. Um, and then for the breeders who are less than 2,000, um, like between 1,500 and 2,000 can also go one way or another. Um, they can either be healthy, um, uh, researched puppies who have healthy parents and ancestors. Um, and it's just a little side thing that, that the family does. They like to raise puppies for families. Um, and they're not really looking to make money off of it. And so they'll just charge a $1,500 um, or $2,000 fee just to cover, like, the cost of the vet expenses and the potential for C-sections. Um, you know, those various um, expenses that come with breeding that you would ordinarily have. Um, there's a lot of dog food that you have to buy for a pregnant and nursing mother. Um, and then, of course, when the puppies start eating, the dog food is gone through pretty quickly. Um, but a nursing mom probably eats more food than the litter of puppies themselves. So, um, but dog food is pricey. The, the vet bills are pricey. The different, you know, the testing that has to be done is pricey. And so when breeders are doing those things, um, it's going to be built into some of, into the pricing that they charge for the puppies because it has to be sustainable for them to continue doing it. Um, and so that's why when prices are going down like below 1500, below 1000, ask a lot of questions because, um, and sometimes it won't be a big deal. Sometimes um, I saw a puppy that was listed for $800 and um, the breeder explained that there was like some issue with like, um, It was like some sort, it was some sort of cosmetic thing, like with the puppy's eye, um, but it wasn't going to cause any long-term ill effects. And so, and we've had a puppy too. Um, we actually donated him, but he was born with um, something called lobster claw malformation. You may have heard of it. Um, it's more commonly seen in people, but his front paws um, had the sort of lobster claw look. Um, he had it in both of his paws, or he has it. He went to a wonderful family. He's an ESA now. His name is Nemo. He's a very good boy. He's a Blenheim. He is Robin's baby. No, Daisy's baby. It's Daisy's puppy. Daisy and Spike. Um, and he's a bit of a tripod. He has to run on three legs because one of his paws is worse than the other. Um, but of course, we knew right away when he was born that um, he wasn't. He was not a puppy that we wanted to, you know, sell for two thousand dollars. Um, and so we kind of spent his puppyhood looking for a family that we could donate him to. And so that you'll find situations like that where, um, you can get a really healthy puppy, a good quality puppy, um, that's been socialized. That's, um, maybe there is an issue, you know, like his lobster claw malformation, um, that they, they can't sell full price for, but that doesn't bother you. Um, and Nemo is an absolutely wonderful ESA for this family. And we're so glad that we were able to hook them up with him. 
um, because at the time when he was first born, we weren't quite sure what to do. Um, you know, we knew we we talked to our vet, and you know, our vet said that you know his cognition appeared you know completely intact. Everything was fine. Otherwise, he didn't have any underlying disorder. It was just just the physical manifestation of that lobster claw malformation. And um, we looked it up, and we it's very 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 rare in canines, and is um, is it's so rare in canines that there's really no statistics on it to speak of. And um, but so they're taking really good care of him and he's a great ESA and um, he's an ESA for a boy who has ADHD. And he has been almost kind of like how Paris was with me. He has helped, um, he's helped this boy relive his life. Like he's, um, he becomes so anxious about different situations and Nemo has helped him live his life again. And so it was just a really wonderful thing that we were able to do. Um, and so, you know, you, it's possible to find a good dog at a, um, at a really reasonable price, but, um, they're usually the exceptions. And so just do your research, um, ask for questions. Um, and the reason we say that so much ask questions is because you don't even have to have good questions to ask because you don't need the right answer necessarily. It's more about how they respond. You know, like the question about how do you pick your moms? Um, you know, how did you come to have the moms you use for breeding right now? Um, they should be able to answer that pretty quickly without having to figure it out. You know, they shouldn't have to work their um, memory trying to recall like, hmm, how did I figure out I wanted to get Robin? Um, you know, all we have to do is kind of look at her and think like, oh yeah, her reader was such and such. Oh yeah, this is what happened. Um, you know, it's pretty quick. It's, you don't need to think about it. Um, and so you want to ask those questions more to get a feel for how well they do their dogs, how they do their whole operation. Um, you just get a better feel when they talk some more. Paris, we just brushed you. How do you have so many mats? Sure, sure. For Paris, May's at her dad's. So Paris didn't get to go this time. Yeah. Daisy is trying to mate with all the girls. And they, they, I keep looking over here because Daisy's been in the laundry room and Remy is like taking her up on the offer. Because Remy's been walking around asserting her dominance to everybody. And so Daisy's over here wanting somebody to mate with her. And so if Remy starts her dominance, then Daisy's happy. <laughs> it's so interesting, their behavior, the way they interact sometimes. Daisy's on break still. She, <laughs> Drew's like, well, it's you know, been a year now. And so I told him, no, she, she needs to have a nice long break. So Daisy, maybe the end of the year, and then she'll have a litter with Macchiato, possibly. Um, but Myra is gonna be, she's right behind me. Um, Myra is gonna, when Myra has her puppies, these will be the first puppies that Macchiato has had with the tricolor. So um, the puppies we had last fall and over the summer were with Missy and a bunch of our Blenums. <laughs> so um, Myra had puppies, but they were a spike. So um, these will be Macchiato's first um, puppies from a tricolor. So we're really excited to see how they come out. Your puppies were beautiful too. I only wish um, Paris's litter had been with Macchiato. If she was only going to have one litter, I should have been with Macchiato. Or Rio. Well, not going to be with Rio. <laughs> Rio was a product of Paris and Spike. Good with Rio. Hi, Missy. Hey, Myra, darling. Little girl. Hi, Remy. Remy is perhaps our most playful 
we got her when um, we brought her home when we had um, a litter of bus. I think they were five or six weeks old. And so she was eight weeks old. And so we just plopped her right into the pen. And so she was like the cool um, older kid. And she was showing them all the fun things they could do to play. And she was so playful. And so then we had another litter that was born um, a few weeks after that. And well, first of all, that litter, so they had, um, we had a couple of puppies stay um, past the pickup dates. So they stayed until they were like 11 weeks old. And so she had playmates for a good month after she came home. Uh, and then we had another litter. And so pretty much from when the time Remy came home until she was about nine months old, we had litters pretty much like around the clock. And so she just always played in the pens with them. And as a result, I mean, she's just grown up her whole life, just always playing with young puppies. And so she's just still very, very, very playful. She loves to play. She's a grown up, but will never be able to take the puppy out of her. She's always gonna be a puppy at heart. Hi, Paris. Her fur is so awesome. You're so cozy. It's so sad that she can't have puppies anymore. I don't think she really cared for being a mom, though. When they were when her puppies were first born, she just I don't know. I think that it was because um, you know she's used to sleeping with May every night and just always tending to May. She. Waits, she kind of waits on May, hand and foot. So when she was suddenly thrust over into our bedroom, having puppies that she was responsible for, and she felt, you know, an instinct to protect, but she also had this draw to go check on May. And so I think it made her kind of anxious. And so that was one thing that just kind of bothered us a little bit about having Paris be both a mom and an ESA. Um, this is another reason that I think that we'll be okay with Vienna not being a mom. She's so tiny. Um, and this is kind of the risk we run by, um, because when we pick our moms, we pick our dads. Um, I'll answer the question that we told you guys to ask. When we pick our moms and dads, we go to breeders who usually either um, show their dogs or they've previously shown their dogs. But they have some sort of connection to um, a professional um, professional grade, you know, some sort of professional standard to have their dogs at. And so that way the generations behind them, Daisy's mom, her grandma, her great grandmother, those dogs have all been health tested. They've all been, they, they were evaluated over years, um, over their lifetimes. Um, and so then when they come to us, we know that their health, they're, they're in pretty good health and um, they have a pretty solid background they have a pretty solid pedigree and um as opposed to just going to a breeder who is selling good pets and you know maybe they health tested the moms that they have but they don't know the grandparents or the great grandparents because they came from another breeder and we have no way of knowing who the, that breeder is and so that's why we like to go to a breeder who um is in a more like professional breeding setting where they have standards that they have to um, their dogs have to live up to because that that just helps us feel more comfortable about um, the moms that we are bringing in and then having puppies from um, to know that their their parents and their grandparents um, have all kind of been cleared for breeding. So um, so that's why we go to those breeders and then we explain um, you know that we're not looking to breed we're not looking to breed cavaliers to better the breed standard to, to breed puppies that match the breed standard that are a certain height that have certain markings. We're not breeding for those purposes. We are breeding for their, their disposition. And so um, 
we essentially we tell them that you know we're not looking for um, the perfect puppy in your litter. We're actually kind of looking for the defect. <laughs> we're looking for the puppy that didn't make the cut, the puppy that you're not going to keep because of their looks. Um, because the thing is, is these breeders that um, have these show dogs, when they have dogs that um, when they have puppies that are not going to fit the mold of a really good show dog because of you know mismarkings or whatever, um, they're still usually very very cute. Um, there, there's never been an ugly puppy where they've been like, "Yep, yeah, here's our reject." And like Daisy, for example, she was like, "Okay, here's here's one of my puppies that um, still needs a family." And Daisy's, um, I know Daisy is not everybody's cup of tea, but um, her defect was her freckles. And I think her freckles are absolutely adorable. I think that, that they are partly what makes her so, so cute because um, she's got such a spicy personality that it can be difficult to take her seriously when she's got these adorable freckles on her face. And so they just add a lot to her, her personality and the whole experience of having her. Um, and so that's why we, that's kind of how we are able to weed through the beautiful dogs that we see in litters of show dogs, um, in order to find, you know, to find this happy agreement with the show breeder who wants to keep, well, usually they want to keep a dog or two from the litter and they'll have them pre-selected usually. And then it's pretty easy then to figure out, um, which puppies we can choose from, but, um, Robin, so Robin's mom is, um, Robin's mom almost kind of looks like Paris where she is all chestnut. And so it's kind of funny that Robin is so white because her mom has so much chestnut and she, her coat almost comes to the floor. She's absolutely beautiful. Um, I think it's Robin's grandmother who, what a dog show. But Robin's got um, her ancestors are all um, her grandmas and grandpas are all um, <clears throat> all do the dog show thing. Be trimming soon too. He's a good girl, Daisy. Hey Daisy, what's up? Hi. Can I help you? Daisy was doing this to me at three o'clock in the morning. She just came and woke me up. And she was acting like she wanted to go outside, but she didn't want to go outside. I don't know what her deal was. <laughs> Paris doesn't want any part of it. All right, Paris. Oh, what? Oh, actually, you can go up. What's... No, don't find that. Is that Paris? Oh, my goodness, Mocha. I keep believing Mocha is in heat. She looks so young still. She does not even look fully grown. Oh, wow. You usually find that by like eight-ish months, Mocha will be eight months and a couple days. And we usually find that, uh, for one, the age at first heat cycle is usually about seven months on average um, from what we've seen. Um, and we, we encourage families, um, if, if this is something that they're interested in, it by no means is a requirement or is going to have a negative impact on your daily living. But um, when families are curious which is preferred, um, 
we usually suggest waiting until after a first heat cycle to spay um, because um, their first heat cycle is showing that they have reached sexual maturity. And prior to sexual maturity, they've not fully developed, fully grown. And especially with boys, and with boys, you might want to wait closer to a year um, because sexual maturity allows for their bones and their muscles to well mature fully. Um, all those sex hormones, they do more than just mature the reproductive organs. And so, you know, if a family is willing to wait out one heat cycle, um, we, we usually, that's kind of the school of thought that we follow um, just because then you know that they have reached more physical maturity before just cutting access to sex hormones. Um, you know, they've been allowed to grow more fully um, because usually by the, by the first heat and by that one year mark for boys, they're probably about like 80% physically grown. Um, like Mocha is probably as tall as she's going to get. She's probably as long as she's going to get but she's going to fill out more. Um, right now she looks really lanky. Um, but if you compare her height, she's taller than Pom Pom. She's about as tall as Robin. Um, she just isn't very mature. Um, and so we'll see over the next few months, we'll start seeing, uh, we notice with our girls too, after their first heat, it's like they have this growth spurt of this outward growth spurt, um, where they fill out. Um, after their first heat, they their fur starts growing in a lot more on their chest and on their bellies. Um, a lot of that sort of development, and so um, is what we expect to see from Mocha in, in the coming months. Now that she's had her first heat cycle, I found a whole brand new roll of Gorilla Tape. Oh, Bella had it upstairs. Yay. I love my Gorilla Tape. Yeah. You are such a beautiful girl, Paris. Sure. So when Paris had her first heat, she did not have all this fur. In fact, I don't think all this fur was grown in until she, like after she had her first litter. But she definitely did not have all this fur when she was seven or eight months old. Or Robin. Robin, when she Robin when she has a full coat of hair, um, our moms their fur always falls out when the puppies are nursing. They're really like as the puppies start weaning, their fur comes out from everywhere. They lose their beautiful tails, all the fur on their belly. A lot of it's already been shaved off, but like what's not shaved off then falls out. Um, it comes out of their uh, mane right here, and it comes out their ears, and so they have these like short, like scraggly ears. Um, and so Robin's is still growing back in now, but her ears are, her ears are getting there and her tail is starting to get some wispies. Um, and so, but Paris has had a chance to grow in and, um, but Paris, or I'm sorry, uh, Robin's got a coat that's a lot more like Paris. And so a puppy from Robin, um, is usually going to have more fur than than what you see with her. Paris. I know you gotta like Brian. Hi Daisy. All right, I'm chicken spoons. We'll go check out the kitty cats. Spike a doo. Come with me, Daisy. No. no. 
<laughs> Sorry, dog. Not all going outside. Oh, if you're trying to figure out how to become a member, um, if you go into the description of the live streams, there is a link in there that says um, to become a member to our channel, something, something, click here, and it will take you to the little join page, even on your phone. And so, yes, desktop is a much easier way because all the buttons are in the right places where they're supposed to be. Um, but... Um, if you're on your phone, you can just go into the description and find the link that we put in there in the description.
Have both their hoo ha's right there for Missy to. Missy's just going to town on both of them. Yep. I've been calling her the Queen Mother. Yes, she takes care of everybody. She's the Queen Mother. Oh no.
Come down. It wasn't playing.
I got them out of I've been chilling. You've been chilling? Yeah. been chilling. Oh, I can also grab something to make it come fast. I'm hungry. You are hungry, eh? Do you want me to start making dinner then? No! It is 3 30. 30 30? 3 30. 3 30. We didn't really do uh, dinner though. Alright, sorry, we didn't do lunch, so we could have an early dinner. No! Maybe, and then some snacks at night time. Snacks at night time. Here, come on, let's go. I'm, I am hungry. I'm, yeah, so come on. Here, let's. I don't want dinner! Okay, okay, we don't have to do dinner, but do you want a one of those uh bar uh those barbecue rib sandwiches? For dinner? Not for dinner, right now. No. Well, uh, we're not doing snacks now. I'm not doing snacks now. That's not nice.
Super, super yummy. Remember, I, I you did a bite of one. I gave you a bite of it, and you're like, mm, "I want one," and I made one for you. So that's what we'll do. We'll have I'll, I'll make these for you and Bradley tonight. Me and Mom will have the uh, the other stuff. What? I don't want one though. What about uh, a, a couple of apple sauce? What? 
You want some applesauce? Like some rocket sauce? Yes, some applesauce. So, yes. I'm not a baby. Applesauce is not for babies. That needs applesauce. So you're going to take all my pants. You're going to take all your pants? No! I'm going to check my pants. What do you mean check them? Wait, I, I go to them and look at oh, them. Oh, check your pants. Plants. I thought you said your pants. I want to check my pants. Right. No. no. My plants. <laughs> pants and plants. Both start with the P, so they rhyme. No, that's not the same. Plants and pants. The pants, plants. Plants, pants. Pants, plants. Go on, plants, pants. Pants, plants. Pants, plants. Can you get my breath? Oh, that was silly, silly, silly. Yeah, exactly. All right, there's your your
Like you brought into the bedroom the other day, and I put it over on my bedside table, and just the smell of it just started making my mouth water. Had yeah. that like creepy barbecue smell, and the McRib isn't like that. Oh, I, I got yelled at by dad because I'm not supposed to be eating so late. Yeah, baby, I'm going to make you food right now, sweetie. Bye.
Bradley Bella Mac Bella got a sandwich for you. No. I've had a runny nose all day. So annoying.
Yeah. Are we having dinner right now? What's the Uh, this is working. Mm -hmm. Oh no, my We're actually. That one looks smaller. That one's actually bigger. Here, wait. You gonna weigh them? I knew it. One ninety two. One eighty eight. I knew it. <laughs> Hey, cool. Yeah, wherever. Go get a Dr. Pepper. No mind. All the cats rush to the door. Oh, I can't hide anymore there. Hey, yeah. I'm getting me uh, a Dr. Pepper. What's up? Yeah, I'll go get it. The cats! Just going out to go get the river is not going to kill you. Oh my god. What are you guys doing? I'm dancing not. for a fly. Oh, you're not going to Easy doggy is easy. Most of like you from when they were younger. Oh, what, this is kind of... This is like cutie pie with me when I was young. Toast? Um, like, Mark is going away. It's getting real thin. Bella! Come on, Bella. Hey, brother, bring your food in here. Come on, Bella. Eat the food. Come on, Bella. Bella, come on.
That is a way cool for it, Dad. That was a really brilliant idea. Did you try it? Put the other way to wider. This one like comes down. Much. Oh, it's Bella, 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 
Be nice to her. Ready. What have I done? 
It's just going to be like food and yeah, gross. Uh. Hi, Dad. Uh, dog is outside now. Who one is here to protect you?
bring the girls in since they're all at the back going to the All right. Get everybody at the door. Yeah, what I do is I call. Well, Myra was. There's only three of them. Girls, what? Go. Uh, I'm ready. Good doggies, inside, inside, inside. Good doggies, good doggies. Seasons room, but I was just out there. Like, that sounds like Paris. My guts. It's like defending the cats from her. No, oh, I was telling her that they're my guts. Oh. Was she happy to see the cats? Yeah, she was trying to get on top of one. Oh, Was she not being a nice Paris?
Hi, doggies. Doggies. Who's good doggies? Who's good doggies?
do more than he used to.
Oh, 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 oh,
She's saying like upstairs. Here, Bella, do you want to use this one? You only, you only spray it if she's misbehaving. If she's, if she's, like, she's like chewing stuff like. Yes, if she's chewing something, you can spray. And then as soon as she stops, then you say, good girl. You make sure she knows like, huh? that she made the right choice. Look by it, huh? Back up. All right, I'll bring Vienna up when she's ready, okay?
Daisy, I see you try and jump up on that table.
Daisy, you stay here. Good girl. Yeah. I'm going to turn this so you guys can see the dogs running. Come on, inside. I guess my room. Yeah, yeah,
Thank <laughs> you. 
Are you ready to come to the pregnancy suite?
Out!
Get out of there. Yeah, out. Get out of there. Come on. Out. Go. Go. Come on. Come on. Good squeeze. Let's go. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh.
that.
Thank <laughs> you.
Good night, folks.